All right, well, lovely to meet you, John. Uh, I mean, I'm going to start by asking, I mean, it must be so incredible to be here in London presenting Titanic, you know, almost 20 years after it was, it was first released, and to see this amount of people still kind of watching it and, and enjoying it as, as like it was the first time. It is very exciting. You know, we premiered Titanic here in London uh, back in 1997, so, you know, 18 years ago. And to come back here to the historic Royal Albert Hall and to really experience the movie in a way I've never experienced it before with a live orchestra. It changes, it's a new experience. And they say you can only experience something for a first time once. Well, there's been a little change and you can now experience Titanic for a first time all over again, thanks to the live orchestra. And when you, you're here in 1997 at the premiere, I mean, did you envisage that 20 years from now it would still be shown and it would still be adored by this amount of people? Do you ever think that far ahead? You know, I, you don't think that far ahead. When, when we were premiering the movie, I was just hoping that it would do enough box office that maybe I could work again and uh, that I wouldn't be thrown out of Hollywood. Um, and then the phenomenon happened and, and music was such a key part of that phenomenon. Um, music, you know, contributed so much to people's response in the theaters to the movie. And now to really put music at the forefront of the film, it's, it's no longer secondary to the film. With Titanic Live, it's putting it out there in front. Do you think that's fair? Because I mean, in some regards, do you think music can be kind of underappreciated in cinema? I think music is definitely underappreciated. Uh, I, I look at music as the window into the soul of a movie. And I think it's oftentimes ignored. I think it was ignored on Avatar where James Horner, I think, wrote equally compelling score that he did to Titanic, but the people thought that the visuals were so strong that they didn't pay attention to that. Uh, you know, and I think with Titanic, it was a little bit different, where people responded to the music, and the music was so linked to the film, which is why you, you saw the success of the score album, uh, because it's not uncommon that we want to listen to music over and over again, because we get something out of it emotionally and James delivered on that emotional core. And do you think uh, watching sort of last night's performance, do you think that allowed you to enjoy the film in a way you never have? And, and are, you, are, you, are you still able to, to watch Titanic or is it one of those things you've seen it so many times now that it's a bit of a struggle? You know, I, I was wondering coming into last night's performance whether I would be engaged in watching a movie that I've seen you know, over the years many, many times. And the orchestra made it a new experience. So I think even if people have seen it before, Seeing it with a live orchestra, it's totally different. And that's how it was for me, that's how it was for James Cameron, who was here last night, and uh, it's pe something people shouldn't miss. I, mean, I was gonna say, I mean, it sold out. I mean, was, was over 5,000 people here last night. I mean, what is it about Titanic then, do you think, that, that makes it such a special movie that people can still enjoy almost 20 years after it first came out? You know, I, I think with any movie, it's, it's a movie that has a theme that is bigger sort of than a genre. People leave the plot of a movie at the theater. They walk away with the themes of a movie. And I think Titanic has very universal themes. And I think, you know, one of the themes is never give up. And I think the movie at the very end shows old Rose in bed, having lived this full and rich life. And I think it reaffirms to an audience that no matter what their situation is, no matter what bills they have at home, what doctor call they got, what child got into a fight, if Rose can get out of the frigid waters of the North Atlantic and go on to live a full and rich life, then I can too. And obviously in regards to Avatar, were you able to find that same strand of intimacy, that same human themes to relate to that? Is that part of what you kind of love so much about that franchise? Absolutely. I think Avatar is full of, of, of human and relatable themes. I think, you know, uh, not only is it a, you know, a, a theme of don't, you can fall in love, uh, you know, with a, a person of a different color or to a person of a different culture, but I think if you look inherently at it, um, Jake Sully is confined to a wheelchair. And he ends up be rising metaphorically and literally out of that wheelchair to become a hero. And that reminds us that there could be a hero inside of each one of us, and we too can maybe make a difference. I mean, it's still you know, the highest grossing film of all time, which is a remarkable achievement. But when other films are out and they're making a lot of money, do you ever look at the box office figures and go, no, stop, stop making money now? <laughs> do, do you, kind of, you, you must be very proud of having that kind of that title. I'm very proud of having the title of having the top highest grossing films of all time, but 
I look forward to another film surpassing it. It's good for the industry. Someone surpassing us won't take anything away from Avatar. Avatar didn't take anything away from Titanic. Titanic didn't take anything away from Star Wars. You know, so I think each movie has to stand in its own. And the more uh, potential success there is in box office, the more movies that'll get made. And there's a good chance the next film that will surpass Avatar is Avatar 2. So my next question is, I mean, how do you top the biggest movie of, of, of all time? You know, I don't think you try and top the biggest movie of all time. I think you try and make another movie that uh, is successful. And what we did with our writers when they came in to work on it, uh, we asked them before starting to write to look back at Avatar and answer the questions, why did Avatar work? And to keep those answers in mind as they went off and, and wrote. And I think that, that's very important. So how, how is Avatar 2 coming along? I mean, you're quite, are you quite far into proceedings now? Or? Well, we're, it's not just Avatar 2, it's Avatar 2, 3, and 4 that we're working on. Uh, we have uh, an art department that has been working for us for over a year designing these movies. The writers are almost done with their scripts. Weta Digital, who did the visual effects, we're working intimately with them as we move forward. But for me, Avatar is not just about the movies, it's about the brand. And we are fortunate enough to be working with uh, Walt Disney Parks and Resorts, building a theme park down in Orlando where people are actually going to get to go to Pandora and, and see floating mountains that are 50 meters high and ride a banshee and go down a, a river ride into the, the rainforest to see the world become bioluminescent at night. We're doing a Cirque du Soleil show that'll be coming out in December. We're, we're doing graphic novels with Dark Horse Comics. So we're really looking to expand the brand of Avatar and the universe of Avatar to allow fans to go back to that place that they loved. Because I mean, do you have much kind of creative say in, in a lot of those things as well? Are you involved in the, in the theme park or the Cirque du Soleil? I mean, how heavily involved are you in that? Or are you very much focused at the moment on just getting those movies made? Uh, I'm very involved in the, in the theme park. I'm very involved in Cirque du Soleil. I mean, uh, you know, we, we take a great pride in, in bringing quality uh, that's associated with the film to these ancillary opportunities. Um, so sometimes much Disney will tell you that the partnership they have with us is the strongest and best partnership they've had and we're there almost on a weekly basis working with them Cirque du Soleil was in my office last week we were reviewing costume designs for the show so we're, we're very involved and I mean you mentioned obviously you're shooting two three and four sort of back to back sort of in a similar vein to, to the, the Hobbit or the sort of Lord of Correct. the Ring franchise but are these standalone films or is there a chance they could be a cliffhanger are they kind of leading on to the next or are these very much got a beginning middle and end of their own accord uh, you know look I think it is our responsibility to make movies that stand alone as individual movies when you step back you might see them as a complete picture with a larger arc but each movie has to work individually uh, Jim Cameron has done two sequels in his career. And I would argue that both times those movies lived up to, if not exceeded, the first movies. One was Aliens and one was Terminator 2. So our expectations, just like those movies delivered, we, each Avatar sequel will deliver. Because, I mean, Avatar really pushed the boundaries of what we thought was sort of possible in modern cinema. I mean, is that, is that happening again? Are you looking at new sort of innovative ways to, to explore sort of this medium and push it to its full potential? Look, I, I think we are continually looking for ways to push innovation to allow us to tell stories that could not otherwise be told and to tell stories in new and engaging ways. Um, we've been working with our team of people. Um, we've had some of the same technical people and artists on since we wrapped the last movie. We've been working with Wedded Digital. I don't know that you'll see uh, a perceived, the same quantum leap, but I think you will definitely see a difference in what we're able to present. And I also think there's a responsibility in the exhibition community that theaters have to do their share so that the in-theater experience you know, lives up to what we can now create whether that's at higher frame rates, whether that's at better sound system, whether that's at brighter projection, uh, because we need to draw people out of their homes to go to movies. And to do that, we need the total experience to be great. So you are sort of looking at higher frame rates then? Because I mean, there was, there was some sort of um, criticism of that in the Hobbit franchise, but you, are you quite confident that you can really use that to its full potential and sort of turn, change some people's opinions on that? Well, let me tell you my view on high frame rates, uh, both prospectively and how it relates to what people perceive from The Hobbit. Uh, people looked at The Hobbit and they were expecting Lord of the Rings, tonally. Peter Jackson made to, chose to make a different tonal movie. Uh, people responded and said, oh, the high frame rate 
did X, Y, or Z, they were blaming a creative choice that they might not have responded to on the high frame rate. But if you look at the Gollum sequence at night in that movie, at the high frame rate, it was phenomenal. So that showed the potential of the high frame rate. So for us, high frame rate is a presentation format. Um, just like Atmos sound is, you don't necessarily record your movie in Atmos. You present it that way. And I think as people learn to use the creative visual tool of high frame rates, the presentation for audiences is just going to be better. Uh, and you don't have to make it, it doesn't have to look like video, it doesn't have to look like this. It's going to look like cinema, but at a higher frame rate. And in regards to the, to the sort of narrative, I mean, do you think we can expect to see humans return in the sequel? Because it obviously takes about 12 years to get to, to Pandora and back. No, I think you will definitely have humans in the sequel. I think that you will have uh, avatars and you'll have Navi. Uh, and I think really, you know, um, as, as we move forward, like in life, it's, 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 it's going to be about the choices you make. You know, uh, there, there are going to be good humans, and there will be bad humans, and there will be good Navi, and there will be bad Navis. And what are the choices you make? And to understand that our actions have an impact both on people around us and the world around us. And can we expect to see a sort of a darker turn in Avatar 2? Do you think, I mean, is there a war coming? Well, you know, I don't want to give too much away from about the sequels, but I, I you know, I think that the, 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 these th three movies will be on an epic scale. Um, and there will, will certainly be action. There will also be an intimate family story, um, you know, because it, it comes down to the characters you're telling stories about. Yeah, because just in regards to the characters, quickly, I mean, obviously, I mean, James Cameron recently was quoted to say, nobody dies in a sci fi movie. Uh, so obviously, Stephen Lang and Sigourney Weaver are the two names that spring to mind. How could we see them feature in this film? How, how are we gonna, is there, could there be flashbacks, or are we going to, how, how might they be? utilized in this, in this sequel? When you go to the movie, you will discover how. <laughs> It was worth a go. Uh, so, my, <laughs> uh, so my final question is, I mean, as a producer, obviously, you know, working is what you love doing. And I mean, rather than project hopping, I mean, Avatar has been a full time job for you now for, for many years mm -hmm. and for many years to come. So I'm just wondering, I mean, you're so invested in this world. What is it about this world that you just love so much? And, and what, why did you just make that decision to, for Avatar to, to take over your whole career? You know, I, I think entertainment today is about creating escapism for an audience, for letting them escape the world that they live in. Um, and to do that by branching out to the other opportunities that might not have existed for storytelling in the past, whether that's digital media, whether that's uh, themed entertainment, whether that's um, publishing, et cetera, et cetera. And Avatar represents all of those opportunities. But at its core, Avatar is also a movie that is about something. It is a movie that, that you know, people can have an impact in people's lives. The first Avatar film opened and closes with basically the same image, Jake opening his eyes. And I, I look at the franchise as a challenge to people for them to open their eyes as well. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much for your time today. It's much thank appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Hey You Guys! Hey, you guys, huh? Hey, you guys. Is yeah. that from the Goonies? It is indeed, yeah. Nice. Hey, you 